Today, asbestos misconceptions and realities. Hello again, I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics and Asbestos Awareness Australia. In today's show, I want to start with a quote from a 2018 article from Australia's ongoing legacy of asbestos. The quote says, The asbestos ban in 2003 in Australia was a significant victory for the trade union movement, but unfortunately represented a story of the lack of political will by governments at federal and state level to act in the health interests of their community. Our survey of more than 43,000 Australian households found that knowledge about the following basic facts is very poor. That the level of exposure to asbestos that is dangerous, the period of exposure to asbestos that is dangerous, the deadliness of exposure to asbestos, and the annual death count from asbestos-related diseases in Australia. Most Australian households have not been properly warned about the risks and impacts of legacy asbestos. They do not know that their lives are at stake and are not using licensed asbestos professionals. Further, most Australians readily exclude themselves from any of the at-risk categories and most think the death count from asbestos-related disease each year is below 50. Overall, the survey findings are consistent with inadequate public information, education and warnings in Australia on asbestos threats and consequences. Our broader research points to long-standing key messages that have been promulgated by James Hardy Industries Limited, James Hardy, and CSR Limited, CSR, and the federal and state governments in Australia to downplay the risks of asbestos exposure outside of workplaces and to mask the scale of deaths from asbestos-related diseases. Messages that are commonly portrayed within official and public health sources in Australia include the following. First, instances of mesophilioma and other asbestos-related diseases are rare and have peaked. Second, the number of historical deaths from asbestos-related diseases are uncertain. Third, public health messaging on asbestos risks should be disseminated on a limited basis so as not to scare the community. Fourth, current cases of asbestos-related disease result from historical settings that no longer exist. Five, the risks of asbestos-related disease are largely confined to working-class older men. Sixth, asbestos-related diseases require or usually involve intense exposure over long periods. Seven, the risks of asbestos-related diseases are largely confined to people with occupational exposure to asbestos. Eight, much of the exposure of the Australian population to asbestos and the comparative incidental exposure levels used in scientific modelling is caused by naturally occurring asbestos. Nine, legacy asbestos products that are bonded or encased are safe and are best left in position. And ten, it's safer to manage than to remove in situ asbestos. Now, in this show, we discuss the first eight of those messages. The last two claims are more complex, and we'll discuss those in a later show. We ultimately categorise these messages as misconceptions or half-truths because they are incomplete and misleading when not conveyed in proper context. At this point, you're probably asking why these misconceptions are still commonly used. Well, public and unequivocal acknowledgement by the industry and the federal and state governments of the continuing risks of legacy asbestos in homes and the associated deaths arising from exposure to asbestos outside of workplace settings would have serious repercussions. Such public recognition of the asbestos crisis would bring asbestos concerns to the forefront of the public mind. The rational response by many community groups 
would then be to expect the federal and state governments to take further actions to reduce the possible deaths from asbestos-related diseases and other societal harms, including the initiation of public health campaigns and warnings, legal reforms to protect homeowners, occupants and tenants, concrete plans to eradicate asbestos from buildings with asbestos in them, including government, commercial and residential properties. However, reforms around the control and handling of asbestos in the residential sector are highly sensitive, both financially and politically. The residential sector in Australia is a crucial segment of the Australian economy, and home prices are a significant contributor to consumer confidence levels. Debates concerning asbestos eradication programs are also fiercely resisted within policy circles for financial and political reasons. These programs are costly and require upfront investment. As such, these steps will only occur when the relevant administrators are willing to openly acknowledge the risks and human impacts of legacy asbestos across Australia, especially in homes. To avoid these difficult financial and political decisions, the present federal and state governments and others prefer to categorise asbestos issues as low priority. To achieve this objective, they continue to use misconceptions or half-truths to convince the public that the general risk of exposure to legacy asbestos outside of workplaces is low. Second, the number of deaths from asbestos-related diseases caused by exposure in non-workplace settings is tiny. Now we conclude that the overall pictures conveyed in these and similar public communications are inaccurate and unsound from a public health perspective because, first, they do not fully or fairly reflect available scientific evidence. They fail to encompass or explain thousands of deaths from asbestos-related diseases in Australia. They result in public health risk management frameworks that are minimalistic and highly complacent given the lives lost and those still at stake. And existing policy health warnings are barely distributed, heavily qualified and largely ineffective. Most Australians lack basic knowledge about the dangers and impacts of legacy asbestos, and thousands more Australians will likely die following exposure to legacy asbestos. So now let's consider the eight highlighted misconceptions or half-truths in turn. The first is that the instances of mesophilioma and other asbestos-related illnesses are rare and have peaked, and that the number of historical deaths from asbestos-related diseases are uncertain. McCulloch and Tweedle confirmed that internal memos from the Asbestos Information Committee, which was a body established by the asbestos industry to handle publicity and lobbying in the United States, recommended use of the following message at press conferences and on television in the 1970s. Asbestos-related disease is rare, the public is not at risk and proper controls have been introduced. Fifty years on, mesophilioma and other asbestos-related diseases are still commonly described as rare by Australian policymakers and health bodies. A guide from a health committee of the federal government entitled Asbestos, a guide for householders, and the general public from February 2013 described mesophilioma as a rare form of cancer, with 90% of patients having a confirmed history of significant exposure. The 2018 Australian Mesophilioma Registry, the AMR, report describes mesophilioma as rare and aggressive. And the Health Risks webpage of the Asbestos Safety and Eradication Agency states that mesophilioma is a rare type of fast-growing cancer that is almost always caused by exposure to asbestos. When medical experts and officials use the term rare, they are generally referring to the incident rate of a disease across the population, with a rare cancer defined as an incidence of fewer than six cases per 100,000 persons. The problem with this form of description or analysis is that it does not consider the morbidity and mortality rates of a disease. 
our researchers examined academic sources, the Safe Work Australia website, asbestos-related websites and other public health material for evidence on the death counts from asbestos-related diseases. The only official source that attempts to estimate the historical death counts from asbestos-related diseases is the Asbestos Management Review Report. And further, the single official source that discusses the ongoing deaths from asbestos-related diseases is the Asbestos Safety and Eradication Agency, the ASEA, with its safety webpage highlighting estimated annual fatalities of 4,000. Our research suggests that the asbestos industry and its supporters have done their utmost to hide or suppress the death counts from asbestos-related deaths within public forums in Australia for many decades. For example, Peacock cites Dr McCulloch, a prior employee of James Hardy, telling a state public health official in 1968 that it helps no one to go on accumulating dubious statistics of death. In any event, there is an enormous gap between the public's understanding of the scale of deaths from asbestos-related diseases and the harsh realities. Our survey of more than 43,000 Australian households found that more than two-thirds of the respondents did not know what asbestos is or could not positively identify asbestos as dangerous to health. Even among the better informed households, 93% thought that less than 50 people died each year from asbestos diseases, with only 5% choosing the 1,000 to 4,000 or more than 4,000 fatality options. Descriptions of mesothelioma and other asbestos-related diseases by official bodies and others as rare within public forums has likely influenced these public beliefs. Continued descriptions of mesothelioma and asbestos-related diseases as rare within the public health guide in Australia may further serve to justify low-level policy responses with the expectation that the death counts will quietly ebb away. If so, this view is poorly informed and complacent. The recorded incidence rate and burden of lung cancer in Australia, including those adversely impacted by asbestos exposure, had never been rare. And as medical research has confirmed in 2003, mesothelioma is no longer a rare disease in Australia. Looking back, scholarly sources suggest total fatalities in Australia from asbestos-related disease from 1945 to the end of 2019 are between 60,000 and 152,000. This estimated death count is already close to or exceeding the fatalities of Australians during all prior wars. So victims of preventable asbestos diseases have been dying in Australia for decades with minimal policy and public acknowledgement and response. Importantly, the death counts from asbestos-related diseases over the last 20 years have consistently exceeded prior projections. When policymakers, researchers and others assumed a declining number of deaths, asbestos-related diseases going forward, they typically assume, first, that the Australian community is well informed and will or can proactively avoid risky exposure to a legacy asbestos. Second, that legacy or in situ asbestos has been or will be removed. Third, that tighter regulation will ensue. Our research suggests evidence to support these assumptions is minimal to non-existent. Let's put the deaths from asbestos-related diseases into perspective. The ASEA estimates of 4,000 deaths per annum in Australia, that's 77 fatalities per week or 11 deaths a day. Annual fatalities from mesothelioma alone accounts for more than 800 deaths per year, which well exceeds or is close to the death rates stemming from other areas of public health risk. For example, the number of accidental workplace fatalities in any given year in Australia is around 250. The number of people who died from AIDS at the peak of this epidemic in the early 1990s was around 1,000. And the number of deaths from COVID-19 in Australia during 2020 was 906. The annual deaths from these illnesses or events are less than or close to the number of mesothelioma deaths each year and are well below the estimated total deaths from asbestos-related diseases. However, 
no website, or officials describe these comparative events or deaths as rare. Instead, public health warnings and systems to mitigate those risks were or are extensive. We urge everybody to stop describing asbestos-related diseases as rare and to instead highlight the actual or estimated number of deaths past and present from these cruel diseases. So the third misconception is that public health messaging on asbestos risks should be disseminated on a limited basis so as not to scare the community. The asbestos industry developed strategies in the 1960s to limit its liability to members of the public who had been or would be exposed to its products. Members of the Industry Association were told to advise the public that asbestos cement products in place and under normal use present no known health risk to the user or to the general public. Leaflets were to be distributed, but not too widely for fear that they would scare the hell out of everybody. Today, the guide from a health committee of the federal government entitled Asbestos, a guide for householders, and the general public from February 2013 is read only by those who proactively search for and locate it online. The content of this public health guidance is out of date, lacks proper context such as the gravity and magnitude of harms involved, and omits the sources and the names of experts that it relies upon. Our research suggests this leaflet is unlikely to persuade people to seek assistance from licensed asbestos professionals. The primary purpose of this guide seems to be to reassure the public that under normal conditions, asbestos in place poses only very low or low risk to householders. Now, there have been no large-scale public health campaigns on the dangers of asbestos in Australia. We were told by multiple private sources that a primary reason for opposing such campaigns is to avoid scaring the public. Leadership, transparency and honesty from policy and public health bodies are critical when public health crises emerge and develop and mass lives are at risk. This fact was clearly highlighted during the COVID-19 pandemic, yet the contrast between the handling of the COVID-19 and asbestos crises in Australia by policy and public health leaders is stark. The risk of and death from COVID-19 have been discussed endlessly within Australian media and political outlets during the past two years. In contrast, no systemic and substantive attempts have been made by the industry, government or public health bodies to properly inform the Australian public that their lives are at risk from legacy asbestos. Tens of thousands of Australians, and possibly hundreds of thousands, have already died from asbestos-related diseases, and these death counts are mounting, with an estimated 4,000 deaths each year. However, these death counts have been carefully hidden from public view for many decades. Under the current low-profile settings in Australia, the levels of knowledge and awareness of asbestos dangers and impacts are likely to remain very low. Asbestos fibres are not visible to the naked eye, and the specific risks of asbestos-related diseases are not obvious or common knowledge. Our survey suggests the level of community awareness about the risks and impacts of legacy asbestos across the community are very poor, especially among younger people. The risks of asbestos are easily explainable to the community. Exposure to asbestos is commonly deadly and everyone should use licensed asbestos professionals to identify, manage and remove asbestos from their homes. Yet these simple messages are rarely conveyed in Australia because such stark content is seemingly viewed by policy makers and public health bodies as overly scarce and alarmist. While well, basic knowledge about the dangers and consequences of legacy asbestos may be scary, Australians should rightly be scared because, without fear, people are unlikely to use licensed asbestos professionals and take appropriate precautions. The real horror in the asbestos space occurs when you or a loved one receives a mesophilioma or an asbestos-related lung cancer diagnosis, and you suddenly become aware of the real dangers of asbestos and the lack of available treatments to treat those diseases effectively. At present, most Australians think this won't happen to them until it does. <laughs>
continued allegations that it is better to limit dissemination of information on the dire risks of legacy asbestos so as not to scare the community do not serve the public or national interest. After a century of deaths from asbestos-related diseases, the Australian population remains highly vulnerable to deadly exposure of legacy asbestos. Now the next misconception we're going to talk about is that most of the current cases of asbestos-related disease result from historical settings that no longer exist today. McCulloch and Tweedle describe the argument that cases of asbestos-related disease arise from historical settings that do not exist today as familiar but cranky. Such claims are long-standing. For example, the 1978 annual report of John Manville Corporation, a large producer of asbestos materials in the United States, indicated that the rising incidence and mortality from asbestos-related diseases was attributable to old conditions and the result of exposures 40 years ago. Similarly, a statement in the AMR 2019 report published by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare indicates that a majority of the present-day mesophilioma deaths are likely related to historical occupational exposures when different regulations and practices were in place. Claims that most of today's cases of asbestos-related disease result from historical settings that no longer exist are misleading and complacent. Related assumptions that the death counts from asbestos-related diseases have peaked or are close to peak levels in Australia because it is 40 years since the initial ban on the use of asbestos were enacted are also simplistic and imprudent from a public health perspective. These claims and assertions fail to reflect the following. First, the majority of the successful mesophilioma claims in Australia submitted through the Asbestos Injuries Compensation Fund, the AICF, from 2008 to 2019 were linked to home renovations. Secondly, the absence of regulation governing the control and handling of asbestos in residential properties beyond workplaces. Now the next misconception we're going to talk about is that the risks of asbestos-related diseases are commonly confined to working-class older men. McCulloch and Tweedle suggest asbestos debates have often taken on overtones of class warfare because the majority of sufferers were working-class people, usually manual workers. The traditional sufferer profile includes the following factors. A lower socioeconomic background. A male gender occupational exposure, and a long latency period between exposure and diagnosis. In line with this traditional profile, a household survey found that most Australians connect asbestos-related disease to old men who worked in mines or factories for long periods, as epitomised by Bernie Banton. That is, many households believe the dangers of asbestos are limited to a small class of people, namely working-class older men, and the risk of asbestos exposure for the rest of the general population is very low. These narrow perceptions or views are dangerous and are leading to policy and public complacency. Data on sufferers with asbestosis and asbestos-related lung cancer in Australia is very limited. The causal factors of lung cancer are not typically known or recorded on death certificates. And while asbestosis is a notifiable disease in Australia, our researchers were unable to locate relevant statistics within public forums. In contrast, diagnosis of mesophilioma in Australia must be reported to state-based registries and ultimately this data is consolidated and published by the AMR. The present registry has operated since 1982, although with changes in departmental responsibilities. The AMR 2019 report indicates that a majority of the notified mesophilioma diagnoses are still male, with an average age of diagnosis at around 75. Many of this cohort might also be classified as working class. However, as often occurred, statistical averages mask the full story. As was noted in a highly respected medical journal in 1964, the floating fibres of asbestos do not respect job classifications. A range of sources suggest that the socioeconomic background of mesophilioma sufferers includes people from all classes and backgrounds, including judges, lawyers, architects, doctors and other professionals, state governors, cabinet ministers, 
and academics. The total number of people diagnosed with mesothelioma annually in Australia rose rapidly from 125 in 1982. The rate stabilised at around 700 to 800 from 2012 to 2019, but increased again in 2020, reaching a record estimated level of diagnoses of 834. These statistics include diagnoses in sufferers from 19 to 101 years of age. And they also include substantive increases in the number of female cases since 2010, with a record 185 estimated diagnoses in 2020. Multiple data sources indicate that females and people younger than 75 have died and are still dying from mesophilioma, as well as from other asbestos-related diseases in Australia. More broadly, international medical sources record the deaths of teenagers from mesophilioma, including a 14-year-old boy. Hence, any notion that all sufferers of asbestos-related disease in Australia are working class, male, old, and likely to be of the same political persuasion, are misleading. Now our next, the sixth half-truth, relates to asbestos-related diseases require, or usually involve, intense exposure over long periods. Mulculic and Tweedell describe the arguments that only heavy asbestos exposure causes asbestos-related diseases as familiar, but cranky. This is an apt description because misconceptions and half-truths about the levels of exposure linked to asbestos-related diseases have been carefully promulgated by the asbestos industry for more than 50 years. For example, the Asbestos Information Committee in the United States, that's an industry trade group, recommended in the 1970s that the public be told that asbestos-related diseases could only be caused by inhaling lots of dust over a long period. In Australia, the guide from a health committee of the federal government entitled Asbestos, a guide for householders and the general public from February 2013, states that 90% of mesothelioma patients have a confirmed history of significant exposure. No sources, though, were provided to support that assertion. The total death counts are omitted, and the alleged 10% of deaths without significant exposures are ignored. Similarly, when viewed on the 7th of June 2021, the Safe Work Australia webpage on asbestos stated that those who get health problems from inhaling asbestos have usually been exposed to high levels of asbestos for a long time. Evidence to support such assertions is highly general and incomplete. Interestingly, prior documents from Safe Work Australia published in 2013 included the sentence above and the following sentences. Currently, the main source of exposure to asbestos fibres are old buildings undergoing renovations or demolition where building maintenance and demolition workers are employed. Homeowners renovating their own homes are also at risk of exposure to asbestos fibres. Mesophilioma can develop from short or lengthy periods of low or high concentrations of asbestos, although exposure to asbestos fibres does not make the development of the disease inevitable. These prior paragraphs regarding mesophilioma cases linked to short periods and low doses of exposure to asbestos and the risks of such exposures during home renovations are no longer emphasised in material available from Safe Work Australia. The reasons for their present exclusion are likely political, as the science on mesophilioma sources and the exposures have not changed. As Musk, a prior clinician and long-time researcher of asbestos-related diseases in Australia confirms pertinent medical information established in the 1960s included the following facts, that all types of asbestos are carcinogenic, that mesophilioma is caused exclusively by exposure to asbestos, that mesophilioma can occur from small doses of asbestos and over brief periods of exposure publication of conference proceedings in 1965 stated that the only safe amount of asbestos exposure is zero and that as far as a safe level of asbestos dust is concerned there is no safe level. So the safe level is nil and anything above the safe level is certainly risky. The personal manager of James Hardy distributed extracts of these papers in March 1966. 
a letter dated February 1965 from Professor Gandivia of the Prince Henry Hospital to the personnel manager of James Harmony indicated that recent published work leaves no doubt of this association between asbestos and mesothelioma and the exposure can be quite small. An article published in the British Medical Journal in 1967 observed that in some cases extremely short exposures of DIY enthusiasts with mesothelioma have been reported. An article published in the Medical Journal of Australia in 1968 warned of the development of mesothelioma after minor exposure to asbestos. In 1970, authors of a study of mesothelioma sufferers involving neighbourhood and domestic exposure in Germany noted the remarkable fact that this exposure may be very short. Consequently published scientific material during the 1960s confirms, firstly, the fact that there is no safe level of exposure to asbestos. Second, that many documented cases of mesothelioma are linked to short and low dose exposures to asbestos. And third, the material risks associated with exposure during home renovations. But as Lee and Driscoll, both medical researchers, note, there is still a reluctance to recognise the causal significance of low occupational and non-occupational exposures and a tendency to ignore or discredit the warnings of scientists. In a seminal legal case in 2020, Amica Proprietary Limited v. Werfel, known as the Werfel case, the Supreme Court of South Australia concluded, after reviewing the medical evidence submitted by both sides, that warnings that emphasise the risks of high concentrations of asbestos dust must be contrasted with published scientific consensus that the contraction of mesophilioma is not necessarily dose-related. James Hardy sought leave to appeal this decision to the High Court, but this application was denied. The harsh realities of a mesophilioma diagnosis were succinctly and accurately described in the Jackson Report. Mesophilioma is especially insidious. Very slight exposure to asbestos fibres may cause it, and the course of the disease is most often short, very painful and fatal. Official communications which claim that asbestos-related diseases require or usually involve intense exposure over long periods lack supporting scientific evidence and are insidious and highly damaging. First, such claims seek to discount the hundreds if not thousands of deaths in Australia from mesophilioma linked to brief periods of exposure. And more importantly, this official messaging poses the greatest barrier to building proper community awareness of the dangers of exposure to asbestos. One can understand why the old industry conveyed those messages during the 20th century. It was willing to do anything to continue making money. However, we struggle to comprehend how public health officials today can sleep soundly knowing that their trusted communications are severely undermining the endeavours of others to ensure appropriate awareness by Australians of the risks and the real possibility of death following brief or intermittent periods of exposure to legacy asbestos. Now, the seventh half-truth is that the risks of asbestos-related disease are largely confined to people with occupational exposure to asbestos. Public messages asserting that asbestos-related diseases are limited to occupational settings are long-standing and form another thread of the strategies developed by the industry in the 1970s to limit its potential liability. For example, an internal memo from Johns Manville, a large producer of asbestos products in the United States, to participants of Health and Safety Council noted that publicity was intended to downplay asbestos risks by making sure all statements for participants point out that the problem is occupational and does not involve a public risk. Official messaging emphasising the links to long periods of exposure is often combined with further official messages that link all or most incidents of asbestos-related diseases to occupational settings. For example, the guidance released by the Health Committee of the Federal Government entitled Asbestos, a Guide for Householders and the General Public from February 2013 claims that deaths from asbestos-related diseases linked to non-occupational sources of exposure and or shorter periods of exposure are a very small number and unusual. The term a very small number and unusual are not defined or explained in this guidance and no sources are provided to support those claims. The host webpage of the above federal guidance argues that it is based on verifiable science yet provides no scientific sources or the names of its experts or contributors 
relied on. Our research analysis suggests this guidance does not fairly or fully reflect available scientific evidence, significantly downplays the risks involved and fails to fully convey the gravity and magnitude of harm of asbestos-related diseases by omitting the death counts involved. The science is clear. For example, in 1964, a landmark article by Selikoff and others highlighted cases of asbestos-related disease from mesophilioma, asbestosis, lung cancer and other forms of cancer in insulation workers with relatively light and intermittent exposure to asbestos. The authors concluded that the possibility of environmental exposure to asbestos had long been known and suggested many other types of tradespersons would likely suffer similar outcomes. This analysis was highly prescient, as large numbers of tradespersons have died from asbestos-related diseases over the last 50 years, including in Australia. In 1967, an article in the Archives of Environmental Health noted that the occupational exposure of insulation workers or textile workers was certainly many thousand times higher than those of neighbourhood cases or family contacts. This finding is important because it highlights the important differences in the documented intensity of exposures to asbestos fibres in occupational and non-occupational settings. An article published in the British Medical Journal in 1967 observed that there is a vast number of do-it-yourself enthusiasts who may be exposed intermittently to highly concentrated asbestos dust. This commentary was also highly prescient. Warnings from public health scholars and clinicians published within Australian academic sources on the specific dangers of exposure during home renovations have increased markedly over the last decade. For example, Franklin and Reed confirmed that of all the current exposures, renovations and removal are the most likely to be associated with the disease. Olson and others conclude that instances of malignant mesophilioma after exposure to asbestos during home renovations are an increasing problem in Western Australia and are likely to continue to be because of the many homes still containing asbestos building products. Olson and others call for active steps to be taken to prevent asbestos related disease in the residential sector. Park and others also conclude that active steps need to be taken to prevent asbestos related disease in the residential sector. And similarly, Gray and others conclude that future cases of asbestos-related diseases and mortality can only be prevented by stringent regulation and careful maintenance and removal of existing in situ asbestos across the country. Reed concludes that exposure to asbestos from the general environment at levels lower than incurred occupationally has had a catastrophic effect. These warnings from independent scientific experts are strongly supported by the plaintiff compensation claims data. More than half of the successful mesophilioma claims made through the AICF during the period 2008 to 2019 are defined by KPMG, the auditor and actuary of the fund, as arising from home renovation or domestic sources. Further, the share of mesophilioma claims made through the AICF involving home renovations increased to 62 and 55% in 2018 and 2019 respectively, with the number of such claims reaching a record 240 in 2019. This data suggests exposure to legacy asbestos during home renovations has been the single largest source category of mesophilioma claims in Australia from 2008 to 2019. The data also suggests that incidents of mesophilioma linked to home renovations are accelerating KPMG explains that these home renovators' claims include both short periods and long periods of exposure and family and home exposures. These claims also include professional tradespersons and home renovators or DIYers. This KPMG evidence is highly significant because mesophilioma claims through the AICF in 2019 equated to 60% of the recorded mesophilioma cases in Australia. A few months after our first sighting of the KPMG data, KPMG removed all source-related data from its 2020 report. We posit that this outcome arose following pressure from other commercial and political interests. In any event, the fact that KPMG may not publish information regarding the sources of future claims does not change the clear patterns reflected in its data sets for more than 12 years. KPMG cannot retrospectively alter its prior reports, and the critical data included within these reports still stands.
Moneyed interest may argue that plaintiffs making claims through the AICF will say anything to obtain compensation. However, the burden of proof rests with plaintiffs in negligence cases and the legal thresholds to obtain compensation are robustly contested and ultimately rely on the balance of probabilities of the evidence presented. Many cases involving asbestos-related diseases do not proceed because the plaintiff cannot satisfy the legal thresholds. Further, if one side believes the evidence is insufficient and is unwilling to settle, the case may end up in court. A good example of this is the Werfel case. In the Werfel case, the Supreme Court of South Australia found that James Hardy should have known by 1980, at the latest, that there was a material risk of contracting mesophilioma from even occasional exposure to asbestos dust, and that this may arise from tradespeople and householders remodelling, repairing or removing asbestos cement products in residential buildings. The Justice states at 153 that we do not find the expert evidence on which James Hardy relies persuasive, and indeed in some respects it supports a finding of foreseeability well before Mr Werfel's exposure to asbestos. And they note at 157 that there is evidence on which foresight of that risk may well be attributed to James Hardy at an earlier time, and in particular the time of an Australian conference in 1968. Notably, the same scientific evidence that the Supreme Court of South Australia suggests ought to have made James Hardy aware of the risks of even occasional exposure to asbestos dust by tradespersons and householders when engaging in home renovations was also available to the public health bodies and governments in Australia. In other words, policymakers and public health bodies should have been aware of the specific risks of harmful exposure to asbestos in non-occupational settings including during home renovations by 1980 at the latest, and possibly as early as 1960s. In 2021, the foreseeability of these risks is much starker, and the number of deaths from mesophilioma and asbestos-related diseases are at record levels, so public communications that suggest otherwise are, in our view, obfuscations. And finally, the eighth half-truth is most exposure of the general Australian population to asbestos and the comparative incidental exposure levels used in scientific modelling is caused by naturally occurring asbestos. Some official websites in Australia imply that the incidental environmental or background rates of exposure of most Australians arise from naturally occurring asbestos. For example, the Federal Department of Health webpage indicates that we are all exposed to low levels of asbestos in the air we breathe every day. Ambient or background air usually contains between 10 and 200 asbestos fibres in every 1,000 litres or cubic metre of air, equivalent to 0.01 to 0.2 fibres per litre of air. However, most people do not become ill from this exposure because the levels of asbestos present in the environment is still very low. Similarly, the Asbestos Safety and Eradication Agency, the ASEA website, notes that background levels of asbestos, levels that occur naturally, are present in the air. And another phrase sometimes used is that asbestos in the air is ubiquitous. The above statements seemingly imply or infer that first, the air we breathe in Australia contains asbestos that is naturally occurring and that is unrelated to corporate activities involving the mining of asbestos or the manufacture of products containing asbestos. And second, the background or incidental rates of exposure to asbestos across the population stem from naturally occurring asbestos that is unrelated to corporate activities involving the mining of asbestos or the manufacture of products containing asbestos. And third, significant incidents of asbestos-related disease and deaths in Australia arise from natural occurring asbestos. We're not aware of scientific or other evidence to confirm those inferences. While asbestos is a naturally occurring material, the range of locations across Australia where it's present underground is very limited. Further, this underground material only poses a risk to human health in its natural form when removed, disturbed or mined. For example, the New South Wales Safe Work website states that less than 1% of the land surface of New South Wales is estimated to have the potential for naturally occurring asbestos within 10 metres of the land surface, mostly in very low concentrations. Recognition of the risks of naturally occurring asbestos is crucial for persons excavating in areas where such materials is located, because workers may be exposed and their activities may result in the release of asbestos fibres into the air. However, 
Given the small areas of underground deposits, the depth at which these deposits lie, and the low concentrations of these deposits, the risks of harmful exposure to these deposits seems remote. In contrast, products containing asbestos that were manufactured and sold by James Hardy, CSR and others were sold extensively for many decades to all sectors of the economy. The scale of harmful or potentially harmful asbestos products inbuilt within public, commercial and residential properties is thought by most experts to be extensive, with asbestos still contained within literally thousands of different products. These asbestos products present a real and substantive risk to human life as they deteriorate or break down over time and or are disturbed during maintenance, renovation or removal. Additional potential sources of exposure for the Australian population to legacy asbestos arise from areas and locations, first, that were mined by James Hardy or CSR, second, that were also used as industry sites by James Hardy and CSR, and third, where waste from asbestos-containing products originally manufactured by James Hardy and others was and continues to be dumped, and fourth, where waste from asbestos-containing products originally manufactured by James Hardy and others is used in present-day building and demolition waste and greenfill. As such, the source of potential exposure for the population resulting from the activities of James Hardy and CSR, and that still pose a risk to human life today, are vast. All of these sources result in the release of asbestos dust and fibres into the air, and lead to an accumulation of breathable asbestos deemed as background exposures. We're not aware of scientific materials suggesting undisturbed NOA is a primary or secondary source of asbestos-related diseases in Australia, or a significant source of asbestos fibres in the air. So when claims are made about asbestos in the air, a proper perspective is crucial. Most of this airborne asbestos comes from the aftermath of the mining of asbestos and the manufacturing of asbestos-containing products in the 20th century. The incident rate of asbestos-related diseases in Australia would likely have been negligible if asbestos had not been mined in Australia and if large amounts of asbestos had not been imported into Australia to be used in building other materials produced by James Hardy, CSR and others. The rationales driving the New South Wales government and others to spend resources mapping out the locations of naturally occurring deposits of asbestos are unclear. This action may have been requested by large resource companies planning to mine the relevant areas. Alternatively, it may be part of a new public relations strategy that seeks to redirect responsibility for deaths from asbestos-related diseases away from James Harvey and CSR. Regardless, Corresponding steps taken by state and territory governments in Australia to identify asbestos threats within the residential properties or to prevent or minimise harmful exposure during home renovations are minimal, non-existent. As highlighted earlier, instances of mesothelioma and other asbestos-related diseases linked to home renovations are well acknowledged and long-standing within the medical literature and warnings from experts about these specific risks have increased markedly over the last decade and yet we found no publicly available evidence suggesting that the New South Wales government or any other state or territory has initiated any processes to identify or map asbestos threats within their residential sectors. And so now to our summary and views. The asbestos industry developed clear strategies in the 1970s to limit its liabilities, to deny the environmental hazards of asbestos beyond occupational settings, and to avoid or defer adverse regulatory actions. To achieve these aims, the following misconceptions were developed. First, instances of mesothelioma and other asbestos-related illnesses are rare and have peaked. Second, the number of historical deaths from asbestos-related diseases are uncertain. Third, public health messaging on asbestos risks should be disseminated on a limited basis so as not to scare the community. Fourth, current cases of asbestos-related disease result from historical settings that no longer exist today. Fifth, the risks of asbestos-related diseases are largely confined to working-class older men. Sixth, asbestos-related diseases require or usually involve intense exposure over long periods. Seven, the risks of asbestos-related diseases are largely confined to people with occupation exposure to asbestos. And eight, much of the exposure of the population to asbestos and the comparative incidental exposure levels used in scientific modelling is caused by naturally occurring asbestos.
As we've discussed, these public messages are based on pseudoscience and do not fully or fairly reflect the available science either in the 1970s or since. Australia finally banned use of asbestos in new products at the end of 2003, but actions taken by policymakers and public health bodies since then to protect citizens from legacy asbestos have been limited, especially in the residential sector. The fact that there is no such thing as a safe level of exposure to asbestos was established in the 1960s and was confirmed by the World Health Organization in the 1970s. Yet. In 2021, official health and workplace safety departments in Australia have redacted sections of their advice that previously referred to the dangers of short periods and low concentrations of asbestos exposure. Moreover, present warnings provided to householders on the risks and impacts of legacy asbestos are poorly disseminated, out of date and equivocal. For example, the guide from a health committee of the federal government entitled Asbestos a guide for householders and the general public from February 2013, and other official messaging from Safe Work Australia, the Department of Health, and others generally categorise the risks of legacy asbestos in homes as relatively low or very low and seek to reassure the public. This guidance continues to state that asbestos-related diseases are rare and continue to emphasise the linkages to intense exposure over long periods in occupational settings. The scientific basis for these claims and assumptions are left unexplained, and the persons providing such advice are rarely identified. These messages do not properly reflect consensus science and do not adequately explain many of the deaths from asbestos-related diseases in Australia. So, history is repeating itself, and the cover-ups and misconceptions that were used in the 20th century are reoccurring in the 21st century. Public messaging in Australia is increasingly based on the old industry mantras developed in the 1960s and 70s, with a possible novel public relations strand that seeks to shift some of the responsibility for asbestos-related diseases to naturally occurring asbestos. Admittedly, the present official messaging has been remarkably effective and could be viewed as a triumph from a public relations perspective. More than two-thirds of the more than 43,000 Australian households surveyed did not know what asbestos is or could not positively identify as dangerous to health. Even among the better informed households, most thought that asbestos is only dangerous to health following intense exposure. Most believe that the most harmful consequences of a harmful asbestos exposure is lung disease, and most indicate that the number of Australians dying from asbestos-related diseases each year is less than 50. These outcomes raise grave questions concerning the transparency and the efforts of the industry, the federal and state governments, local councils, scholars and the media to acknowledge and explain the facts of the asbestos crisis, including the mass death counts, the real and substantive threats of legacy asbestos and the public health and safety options to save lives. The evidence reviewed suggests that the asbestos industry, its supporters and officials are still carefully controlling public messaging on legacy asbestos risks and masking the scale of asbestos-related deaths from the community. In particular, moneyed interests who would be adversely impacted by tighter public health measures continue to pressure policy leaders and public health bodies to deny or suppress data that highlights the incidences of asbestos-related diseases linked to settings outside of workplaces. They do so in order to first avoid the cost and reputational damage from conducting public health campaigns and warnings, second to avoid the repercussions of more stringent regulatory settings governing the control and handling within Australian homes, and third to avoid the cost of removal of legacy asbestos from public and commercial properties and infrastructure. The temptations for policy leaders and others when dealing with large-scale contentious issues such as asbestos are to hide the issues, to defer action, to distract attention elsewhere and or to pass the costs and responsibilities to somebody else. All these strategies have been used in the asbestos space for more than a century and will likely be used for generations to come unless the public uses its voice. Within this environment, Australian citizens are highly vulnerable and will continue to die senselessly without being appropriately warned, without taking any precautions and without proper and prudent acknowledgement from James Hardy, CSR, the public health sector or any level of government. The value of unequivocal and highly public warnings by the industry or public health bodies about the grave risks of legacy asbestos, including the risk of death 
from occasional exposure during home renovations should not be underestimated. If such warnings were given by public health bodies, others would be less hesitant and guarded about speaking out on asbestos risks and deaths. Proper debates on the most appropriate policy and public settings to save the most lives from asbestos-related diseases could then progress. The only known cause of asbestos-related disease in Australia is exposure to asbestos. And so the estimated 4,000 deaths per annum are preventable. Unlike COVID-19, asbestos-related diseases are man-made, and the risks of death following exposure to legacy asbestos arise primarily from the business activities of James Hardy, CSR and others. There are clear public health and associated policy options that would prevent or minimise future deaths from asbestos-related diseases in Australia, but these options would have political implications and would require investment. So, the only substantive question today is the priority placed on the value of human life. Federal and state leaders must decide whether they are willing to save future lives from asbestos-related diseases, continued inaction, or low-level responses represent acquiescence to the avoidable deaths of many citizens. Finally, a word about Asbestos Awareness Australia, which is a registered not-for-profit company limited by guarantee, and it's a registered charity and has the endorsement from the Australian Taxation Office as a gift-deductible recipient. The company was set up to enhance public awareness and knowledge of the dangers of asbestos threats, to promote measures and policies that prevent or minimise the harms from asbestos-related diseases, and to achieve these objectives, the company provides public access to widely sourced information on asbestos risks and impacts, including the associated medical, legal and political debates. I'm Martin North from Asbestos Awareness Australia. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.